All right, so welcome to week two. I want to just kind of revisit the syllabus here with our schedule. So by now, you guys ought to have completed the week one stuff, the week one discussion. Hopefully, you have also done, you know, week one for your researcher discussion assignment and completed that prep objective in Alex. And there are no points for that prep objective, but it's really meant to help prepare you, you know, mathematically for some of the stuff we're going to be doing. So hopefully you did that. There were just the 20 questions in there. You can also still go back and do that stuff. So let's just look at that real quick. Let's see if, yeah. So we'll pull up Alex here and show you what it all looked like. Yep, so on your pie, it ought to show how many of those topics for the prep objective that you've mastered. So it still shows I've only done 15. I can go into this class progress and keep working on those. Or notice you can also work on your homework for chapter one. There are 21 questions. And then also you're gonna wanna do that quiz number one. I would do the homework first. Make sure you're comfortable with all the you know, topics. And then also do quiz one by Sunday at midnight. Okay, you can also always go into the menu and scroll down to the assignments. And so you can see here is homework chapter one and then the quiz chapter one. And so this gives you, you know, that kind of detail information, unlimited attempts, et cetera, et cetera. Right, the final submission date, you know, if you did it late is December 13th. I will accept late assignments. So hopefully you guys will just keep up week by week. It'll be very helpful. Okay, and so again in the modules, we're in week two. So you ought to be reading chapter one this week in the book. And these are the lecture notes. We are covering chapter one this week. And really today is the only live Zoom. Okay, so we're gonna look at everything in chapter one today as best we can. And then, you know, your homework and quiz, and you're gonna wanna participate in the week two discussion. And I see some of you already have. And again, these are mostly meant to be student to student interactions. So unfortunately, you know, I don't have the time to go in and, and respond to everything like I normally would like to. Um, yeah. I have managed to do it before, but um, yeah, normally not. <laughs> Okay, so that's just kind of like a regroup. You know, again, from week one, you're going to want to keep up with that researcher discussion assignment. I don't want you to put that off. So go into modules, all the way down, the researcher discussion module, the researcher module. 
So if you haven't yet, or you didn't attend the lecture where we talked about this in detail, I have a video here. You might wanna even refer back to it. You'll wanna download this document. You're gonna focus on just 10 weeks. So why not choose week one to focus on? It's got the grading rubric here. You'll put week one and hopefully give yourself 10 points. You'll put week one, copy and paste your post from the week one discussion and any other relevant conversations. Relevant meaning something that's relevant to you that you want to reflect on. Okay, something that struck you, something that inspired you, something that you just wanna comment on. And then any other thoughts from class, something maybe we talked about first day, we talked about a lot of stuff or, um, you know, broadening out to emails you got from school, um, stuff going on in your community or worldwide. You know, a big thing for me was, you know, Serena Williams. There was a huge spotlight on her last week. Still kind of is. Um, and you know, there are a lot of statistics on her performances over her brilliant career. So, you know, that might be inspirational to you how statistics are used in, you know, um, everyday type world events. So maybe that's something you wanna reflect on for this, for last week or even this week. Okay, so you're just going to keep filling out that document and there will be three, um, you know, kind of progress checks. First one coming up in week four. This is week two already. So time flies, right? All right. Um, also, just as a reminder, I do have the lecture notes for this week and you might wanna print them out and write along, you know, adding any notes or if you're working on a tablet, you might wanna open them on your tablet and write as we go along. Okay, so we're gonna actually start looking at our content for statistics. This up to the beginning, still letting students in. All right, so statistics, it's a branch of math. Sometimes people think it's, you know, separate, but kind of overlapping a little bit. Um, dealing with the collection, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of data of data. So this was one definition that I found. You know, like anything, there are numerous definitions out there, but this is good enough. Oh, okay, and there's a question. If you miss a class, how can you rewatch the recording? Thanks for bringing that up. So I'll remind you here on our homepage, in the table, I've got the lectures videos linked right here. So you can either click on the icon or the text. And it takes you to my YouTube page, my YouTube channel, okay? Which is just youtube.com user Dr. JSS Ward. And again, you can subscribe to my channel and go to the playlists and go to stat one, view full playlist. So this is where the videos are, okay? So, so far there's the welcome orientation, the researcher discussion, and then this was our intro. I have two sections. And then, um, you know, this was last Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Yep. You're welcome. Okay.
So stats, it's basically about collecting, interpreting, and presenting data. And it's hugely powerful. I'm going to come back to this exercise. There are two branches of statistics that we usually talk about. Descriptive statistics. And as the name implies, you know, this is the branch that deals with describing the data, organizing it, summarizing it, you know, listing it, presenting it, all of that kind of descriptive type, you know, activity. And then there is inferential statistics used to make estimates, predictions, um, and to test hypotheses. So this is the powerful, you know, kind of piece. I mean, they both are, because, you know, just being able to organize and present data can be extremely powerful too, but being able to make predictions, um, you know, about the weather, about how many people will die from a virus, you know, everything from A to Z. Um, that's the true power of statistics. And then probability is something we're also going to be discussing in this class. And that field looks at the chance or the likelihood of events happening. Okay, so it's three similar. Okay, so this example that I have here, collaborative exercise, I got this from our textbook. And I wanted to actually do this. It says, in your classroom, try this exercise. Have class members write down the average time in hours to the nearest half hour that you sleep per night. Okay, so I want you guys to put type in the chat the average number of hours that you sleep per night lately. You know, and if you're like me, that might vary widely, wildly even. Um, but so lately, put in the chat, on average, how many hours per night do you sleep? And then I'm going to enter this in this dot plot maker. And I'm going to create a simple dot plot, very similar to this one that's up here. Right, so notice, here's the list of the data. Pull up. My highlighter here, right? The five, five and a half. You can see there's one dot for five. There's one dot for five and a half. There were three students who said six. Here's the three dots for six. So it's the frequency, right? There's three at six. Four students said six and a half, right? Two students said seven. So you can see how much more kind of powerful it is to arrange the data to present it like this in a dot plot, right? We can easily and quickly see like what's the most kind of popular or frequent response, right? Four responses were six and a half. And they're kind of clustered more around this six, six and a half and seven. So let's look at our class. I'm gonna go to that. This from my last class. I'm gonna go to this dot plot maker. And you guys have all typed in your answers, right? If you haven't yet, I'm asking you to type the average number of hours that you sleep per night lately. So I've got an eight, a seven, a six, seven, six. And you can see the dots showing up there. Seven, four. Bless your heart, Sosa, right with me. Eight, seven, 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 six. 
eight. Seven, eight, fortunate people. Seven, eight, seven, six, seven. Okay. Uh, we're still missing some people. I'm just saying. 27 participants, including me. And I'm going to put myself in there. I've been sleeping an average of four hours per night, sadly. <laughs> yeah, so, so I understand that. Same with my cat. His, um, you know, the cone is really, he's wearing a cone. And that's really disturbing him. And he's, you know, his whole schedule is off. I mean, he was already waking me up early every day anyway, but but now it's it's way worse. Yeah. Okay, anybody else want to share or is that it? Yeah, yeah, I understand. <laughs> and, you know, I've had many a cat who would sleep in as well. They're all just different. So, you know, what are you going to do? Um, all right, so let's look at this dot plot, and you'll notice, you know, this one, it's in GeoGebra. It's kind of like a combination of geometry and algebra, GeoGebra, but it's hard for me to say. Um, but you can see with our dot plot here, way more sevens, right? And then interestingly symmetric about there with the sixes and eights. And then us two sad cat owners down here <laughs> with the fours. So let's compare this to the one from the book. And it suggests we do that. Does your dot plot look the same or different from the example? So it looks different, right? I mean, ours here, the most was six and a half, and here's the most was seven. So it's kind of shifted to the right a little bit. We're we're kind of getting more sleep as a whole class than this class. On the other hand, no one's getting nine hours. You know, this is it's kind of more spread out and flat. While ours is more kind of concentrated and peaked. Um, and I would say Sosa and I are outliers, and we're going to get to a technical definition for that term, but basically, you know, everybody else tends to kind of cluster or trend around a certain group, and we're, you know, way out there. Um, like here, you might think of nine as an outlier. Um, here's another question. If we did the same kind of survey in an English class with the same number of students, do you think the results would be the same? Why or why not? What do you guys think? What if we did this dot plot for an English class? So Connor, it's a great point right? It might just be the exact same because students are taking math and English, right? And, you know, what if, what if we did, um, like at a university, maybe at Cal State Long Beach, an upper division English class for only English majors? Versus maybe a STEM class, yeah, for like only math majors or only statistics majors. So you think maybe STEM students would sleep less? And why is that? What do you guys think? 
And does anybody agree with that? Maybe because of the course of information, like exactly more work. Right, and that's what Paul was saying too. Thanks for hopping on. Um, it's true, you know, in the homework sense, right? You get maybe more of that daily homework. And so maybe more work means less sleep um, because they're worried about the work or maybe they're literally doing the work and it takes so long to do the work. Like when I was an undergrad, I had so much homework in all my classes. You know, I, I worked maybe 20 hours a day on homework. Um, another theory might be, you know, there's so much more work, you need to sleep more so you can focus and do it better, right? I mean, it's another possibility. We could make it conjecture. And then you could actually go and survey those classes and see if you were right, you know? Um, let's see, STEM is more practical. So you think it takes up more time? I know my, did I already mention this, but my roommate in college, she was um, a philosophy major and then she ended up double majoring in women's studies. But she would mostly, you know, have classes where there was one paper midterm due and one paper or a final due. And that was it. That was it all semester while I had homework due, you know, every week. And so she could kind of, you know, mess around and then cram like the night before a final or write a paper the night before. And she still got A's. You know, it used to really irritate me, <laughs> but I mean, good for her. She was able to do it. But so all of this kind of, you know, collecting, displaying and talking about and interpreting, this is what statistics is really used for, you know? Um, so like it says here, you know, as you begin to analyze and interpret your data, you've begun your study of statistics. And this really is what it's like. We can, you know, collect data, make conjectures, and then see if we're, you know, spot on or not, et cetera. So, you know what? I'm going to take a picture of this. And I'm going to do this again later on in the semester. And what do you guys think? Do you think it will change? Do you think the data will look different toward the end of the semester? Yes, how so? So this is the beginning of the semester, right? <laughs> and what do we think? We think data will change. And we think students will get less sleep, heavier course load, plus the holidays. I agree with that. Yeah, and we'll have done more work with less sleep. Yeah, there'll be more projects and more things to study for, right? Midterms, finals, yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna save this and we'll come back and do this again and we'll see. Team less sleep, <laughs> right? Classes haven't fully taken off yet, it's true, yep. So see, I did my sleep study in my earlier class and now this is 225. Okay. We think it's bad now, right? I mean, hopefully Sosa and I are getting more sleep. I don't know about the rest of y'all. All right. And hopefully, you know, hopefully it'll still seem like a fun class though, you guys. I mean, hopefully these things are like fun to think about and stuff. That's what I'd like to, to think. And a mean is another word for average. 
you guys have probably encountered some of these words before. Um, the median. The median means, and I'm going to go back here because, you know, again, these numbers were listed as well as plotted here. If you list all the data, the median is basically the middle number. And if you have an odd number of things, you know, you'll have an absolute middle. Like for example, suppose I just took, you know, five students' data. Somebody slept five hours, maybe a couple of students slept six hours, one student slept seven hours, and one student slept eight hours. Well, look, there's a middle, right? That's the median. But suppose you have an even number. Suppose I just asked the first four students. Now there's not a middle anymore. So you have to take the average of the middle two. So the average of those in this case is six. You would add them and divide by two. So, um, so yeah, it's nice that we get these, you know, statistics or these calculations. And the standard deviation tells us roughly, you know, how the data deviates from the mean. And we're gonna we're gonna look at that more in this class. The Sam calls, I'll tell you. All right. So let's look at 1.1. In statistics, we're generally looking to study a population. Okay, so we wanna know something about, for example, the population of all students at Long Beach City College or all students at Long Beach State University or all people who live in the city of Long Beach. These are examples of populations or we want to study all of the trees in, you know, Northern California, um, or we want to study all the frogs who live around a certain pond, or we want to study, so they don't have to be people populations, but it's, it's an all thing. We want to know about all mountain lions in Southern California, or, you know, all, um, all drivers on the 405 freeway. <laughs> so some collection of things, including people that we want to study, a parameter, a parameter is a number that describes some aspect of the population. So maybe, you know, like, oh, um, the average amount of sleep of all students at our college, that average would be called the parameter. Okay. And no worries about the internet and so getting private messages. Um, parameter describes an aspect of a population. Notice they both begin with P also. Now, oftentimes, and I mean, almost literally every time when, you know, researchers are trying to study a population, it's too cumbersome or too time consuming or too costly or literally not feasible to study the entire population. And so we take a sample, which is some subset of the population, right? So again, oh, we wanna know, you know, on average, how much, how many hours students at Long Beach City College sleep. It would be way too much to try to survey literally every single 
student out of the 40,000 odd students we have going here. So we might take just a sample to give as an idea. This is exactly what goes on. Like when you think about politics, sorry to bring this up, but um, you know, we want to know roughly like how popular a candidate is, right? And um, you know, basically we want to know, let's say out of the state of California, you know, how likely is somebody to vote for? What is that runoff in LA between Karen Bass and I see the commercials on TV all the time. I forget the other candidate. Does anybody remember? That runoff. Rick, Rick Caruso, that's it. Karen Bass and Rick Caruso are in a runoff. And we want to know for LA mayor, mayor we want to know how likely are um, residents of LA County to vote for one or the other. We can't literally poll every single person in LA County. Maybe it's LA City. I'm not sure who gets to vote for the mayor. Let's just say county. And so what we do is we take a sample to give us an idea. And based on that sample, we extrapolate and say, you know, we, we infer that that's roughly the percentage that will vote for one candidate or another. Okay, so we take a sample and then we do a calculation and that calculation is called a statistic. So a statistic is a number describing an aspect of a sample while a parameter. So, it, you know, in this case, we really want to know the parameter what percentage of people will favor, say, Karen Bass? That's a parameter. The statistic would be from a sample. So we take a sample of maybe 200 residents and ask them who they're going to vote for. And the percentage voting for Karen Bass would be called the statistic. The percentage voting for Rick Caruso, that would be a statistic of that sample. Are you guys with me? It's all about understanding all of this yet. Oh, it's still, okay. So here are some little examples. Um, use the scenario to identify populations and samples. So let's just look at this first one. A beverage company wanted to see if people in the United States liked their new logo, right? So an, a logo is some image that represents their company, right? Like their brand, like the Nike Swish or something, right? Can it really try to draw a Nike Swish? Okay, hold on just a second. Okay, cat's screaming at me, hold on. All right, so sorry. I worry about him on the stairs, so. um, Yeah, so beverage company wants to see if the people in the United States like their new logo. Which choice best represents a population? A selection of logo artists, every person in the United States, a selection of shoppers from different states, 3,800 children aged five to 15. What do you think, A, B, C, or D? 
pulses B. What do you guys think? Couple of Bs. And B is indeed correct. Every person in the United States, that's the whole population that they are considering, right? I mean, sometimes a company might just want to know what people in a state think because they're only going to be distributing in the state of California or Florida or Kansas, wherever. So, you know, for this scenario, though, they're looking at all people in the United States. So, yes, it's B. All right, for two, a musician wanted to see what people who bought his last album thought about the songs. Which choice best represents a sample? So every person who bought the album, a selection of people who didn't want to buy the album, 250 girls who bought the album, a selection of 3,294 people who bought the album. Dana saying D. So now we're looking for a sample, not a population. And remember, a sample is going to be not the whole population. So not everyone who bought the album, but just some group. And we don't want to just narrow it down to girls, right? Why, why would you want to try to, that would bias your results maybe, you know? We want to have a sample represent the whole population. So one would think that, you know, male, female, non-binary, you know, whatever, <laughs> would be buying the album. So you don't want to restrict it. By. Okay, so I have the answers in here too, if you guys want to look through that. And let's pull up some Alex homework questions and see here. Okay, so differentiating between parameters and statistics. Laura, a nurse manager at a local hospital, wanted to know more about the hospital's full-time nurses. She pulled 10 nurses at random who work full-time at the hospital. The findings in the poll were that these nurses take on average 5.8 sick days per year, 60% of them would prefer a four-day work schedule, and six of them are married. Laura didn't know that the top hospital administrators had already surveyed all nurses who worked full-time at the hospital. In that survey, it was found that the nurses take on average 6.3 sick days per year, 57% of them would prefer a four-day work schedule, and 74 of them are married. So what is the population and which is the sample? And they have drop down menus. So the population, it's all of them, right? All the nurses. And then the sample is just the 10 randomly chosen nurses. Does that make sense? Feel free to give me like a thumbs up. Remember the reactions. Give me some love. <laughs> All right, thanks. So, see, 
This is for all nurses who work full time. And in the survey, it was found, these parameters were found. I'm doing all the parameters in blue and all the sample statistics, right? are in purple. All right, and then, so the average of 6.3 sick days per year taken, is that a parameter or a statistic? Six point three, right? The six point three was from all nurses. I did blue for parameter, right? And then sixty percent of the randomly chosen nurses. That's the statistic. Six per six randomly chosen nurses. That's the statistic. Okay. Does this make sense, y'all? All right. Okay. As we are studying um, different aspects of populations and samples. We use variables, usually denoted with a capital X or a capital Y. So that stands for some characteristic or measurement of each member of the population. There are numerical variables and there are categorical variables. So as the names imply, right, numerical variables are for data that consists of numbers, oftentimes also called quantitative versus qualitative. Quantity, quantitative for numerical, qualitative, like quality in these categories. Right, so what's your gender? You know, male, female, uh, non-binary, prefer not to answer. Those are different categories. What month did you start school? Those are just categories. What building is your class in? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So let's look at classification of variables here. Is voting status, let's say we were studying, you know, to see like how many students, what percentage of students is registered to vote? So we survey them and they're either registered or not registered. Is that variable quantitative or categorical? Um, and Linda, so these notes are in our class. They're the lecture notes in week two. And they're right here, chapter one, sampling and data. You're welcome. So registered or not registered? That is categorical, right? Annual salary in dollars. That's going to be a number, so that's quantitative. Customer satisfaction, very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, somewhat dissatisfied, or very dissatisfied. What's that going to be? Q or C? <laughs> Q. 
Yeah, those are different categories. Type of shirt on the clearance rack, long sleeve, short sleeve, blah, blah, blah. Those are categories, right? Okay. That was it for one one. One two, section 1.2 is on data sampling and variation in data and sampling. So most data as we've seen can be put into either a qualitative categorical or a quantitative like numerical categories. For quantitative, those numbers could represent, you know, discrete data or continuous data. So discrete is something can, that can be counted. Um, like the number of books students have on their shelves, right? You're not gonna have like a half. You're gonna have 10 or 11 books on your shelf or whatever. Um, continuous is something that's measured. So like the amount of time that has transpired. Time is, is a really common one. Um, you know, how much time has elapsed? Like even now in our class, um, you know, it's been what, 35, 47 minutes and so many seconds and so many fractions of a second, you know? So time is continuous. Uh, weight, pounds, age, height, these are all continuous things. Temperature, discrete, like cost, dollars, even cents, you know, savings, the number of samples, the number of customers, etc. Okay. And then these are typical ways of representing categorical data. Um, we oftentimes use a bar chart, like this picture on the left depicts. So, you know, number of students who take the bus to school, maybe it's an elementary school versus a car versus walked, could be a college, or presented in a circle graph or a pie chart. Notice those add up to 100%. So the whole pie is filled in there. Um, here's another bar chart. We've got percentages instead of you know numbers, which is fine. Like the ethnicity of students, Asian, Black, Filipino, Hispanic, et cetera. And you can see the percentages. So you can get these kind of relative heights. It's a helpful way of representing data. This is a Pareto chart. That's that same data. But now we've listed from, you know, from greatest to smallest, biggest to smallest. So 36.1% is the highest, and then 24.5% is next, et cetera. So it's just a different way sorted by size. So those are, are common ways of representing categorical data, common ways of representing measurement data, like a histogram, a bar graph, with a frequency distribution of some quantitative data and the horizontal axis is a number line. So this is oftentimes, you know, how we would present like a score distribution. So how well did students do on their exam in class or how well did they do in the class period, you know? And you might say, you know, 
from zero to 50, and then from 50 to 60. So up to 50 is an F in the class. You know, that's a D in the class, a C in the class. Oops. Acid. <laughs> It's hard to write like this. A B between 80 and 90 is an A, and then between 90 and 100. Oh, sorry. 70 to 80. Mess that up. This is still, I did mess that up. I think I would have these uh, number charts pretty well down. That's an F. Uh, this is still an F between 50 and 60. Between 60 and 70 is usually a D. That's usually a C, a B, and an A. And so, you, you know, there might be maybe like three people who got less than 50, you know, maybe four people between 50 and 60, maybe a lot of people got, um, I was going to say a C, et cetera. Maybe one person got a D. So you get this kind of histogram, and so many got a B, and maybe so many got an A. So that's typical for grade distributions. So this is telling you the frequency, like the number, of each one of those categories. And then there's a time series. <clears throat> so maybe, um, hey, how many hours did you sleep last week? This was for Monday, and this was for Tuesday, and this was for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And you're gonna like connect the dots. Um, and then there's a stem and leaf plot. So these are all ways to organize this numerical quantitative data. And this has a stem and a leaf. In just a moment, please. Okay, sorry about that. So the stem and leaf, you have a stem. This tells you the first, in this case, two digits of a number. And then you have one data point that ends in a zero. You have another one that ends in a zero. Then you have one that ends in a one. See what I'm saying? You add one of the leaves to the stem. Another one ends in a one, and then one ends in a seven. And then you have three, four, zero, three, four, one, et cetera. Okay. And we're going to look more at stem and leaf plots in chapter two next week. So let's look. At the homework here. Discrete versus continuous variables. The interest rate charged by a local bank 
total attendance at a public school, the time it takes to drive from home to work or school, and an estimate for the height of a three meter image. You guys write down D or C, D or C, all four of those, and we'll check. Okay, so an interest rate, like that's continuous, because you could have like 4.125987, et cetera, percent interest. Um, total attendance, you're gonna have whole people. And time is continuous. An estimate for a height, again, height, it's some kind of a length. Uh, that's continuous also. Okay. All right. And we need the methods here for this next problem. All right. So before we move on, this is actually probably a good place to take a break. So let's Take a break. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about how to collect samples, different methods. Um, and just in general, as I've mentioned, a sample that we've taken should have the same characteristics as the population it's representing, right? A random sample is one in which every member of the given population has an equal chance of being selected for the sample. <clears throat> so, one type of random sample is called a simple random sample. And this, this is really commonly used. So it's one in which every possible sample of a particular size has an equal chance of being selected. So that means, you know, I want a simple random sample of like 30. I want 30 randomly chosen students to represent, you know, um, students who are taking statistics at Long Beach City College. And there are various ways of obtaining the simple random sample, like drawing names from a hat. So we probably have like, I don't know, 15 sections of statistics. Each one has maybe 40 students. So that's like 600 students in, a, in stats. I could write all 600 names down on pieces of paper, put them in a hat, and then randomly just draw out 30 names. And that would be a simple random sample. You know, if I had dice that had, you know, that could add up to like 30, I could roll the dice until I chose 30. Um, What's more common now is with computers, you know, every student has a student ID number and I could randomly choose 30 student ID numbers for those students in the statistics classes. So um, 
let's see how even on your calculator you can do that. So notice how to use a TI-83, 83 plus, or 84, 84 plus calculator. And remember, everyone really ought to have their own graphing calculator. If you don't have one, you could get one through the loan program at the Math Success Center. Or you could use one of those free utilities I've showed you, but you're going to need to get one. Okay, so for now, I'm just going to show you on the 84 plus here. And it says press math. Here's the math button. Make this a little bigger. Press the math button, arrow over to PRB. That stands for probability. So this is the menu of probability things you can do. And then press four for random integer. A uh, five, rather, for random integer. You could also arrow down. You could enter five. And then if you put zero, 30, here's the comma. And then press enter. This gives you a random number between zero and 30. You could enter again. These are random numbers between zero and 30. Okay. Um, you can also add a digit after the 30. So suppose I know, I'm gonna arrow up here, press enter. So suppose I want a number between one, and about 600. And I want to choose, you know, five, five random numbers from one to 600. This gives me one, two, three, four. And I have to arrow over, see the fifth one. Okay, so it's pretty cool to have this random number generator right in our calculators. I have this website here too that has all kinds of other different random generators. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna carry on right now. But if you wanna go back and look at that yourselves later, you can. Um, All right, these are some different sampling techniques. Random sampling, again, it just means you're selecting the sample in a random fashion. Um, if you are taking a small sample size, that's gonna introduce some error. We're gonna be talking about some of this. The pros, highly effective when all subjects participate in data collection. And then there's something called stratified sampling. Stratified sampling. So the idea of stratified sampling is that you're going to either break things down into groups or naturally, you know, use different groups, subgroups, which are also called strata. So for example, these were just some little notes I was writing from my last class. Now suppose you wanna um, survey students who are living in dorm. In a dorm over at UCLA, and there are you know, five floors. So we wanna survey students, in a dorm. And let's say, um, I'm trying to think over at UCLA, but let's just say a general university. And there's a dorm that has say 10 floors. And you wanna know what students in this dorm think about, you know, 
I don't know, how well do they like living in the dorm? Okay. And you don't want to go to literally every student who lives there because there might be thousands of students living there. You know, if it's anything like the dorms I was in, some of those rooms have like four, six people per, per room. And then, you know, you've got many rooms for each floor, et cetera. Um, so maybe what you want to do is, you know, choose like three random floors. Oops, I wanted to choose the orange there. So you're gonna use your random number generator and choose three numbers between one and 10. Three random floors. And then on each one of those floors, you're maybe going to get 10, 10 students, you know, for each of those floors. Okay. So this is the idea of stratified sampling. You have some, you know, subgroup, like the floors. And then you're going to take, you know, a random number of them. And then within each subgroup, you're going to take some random number to study. Another example, maybe you own the franchise of Taco Bells and you want to survey employees who work at the Taco Bells. And there are hundreds of locations nationwide. So first you're going to, you know, you're going to use stratified sampling and first you're going to choose maybe 50 locations. And then you're going to pick maybe 10 employees or 20 employees at each of those 50 locations. So the idea is, you know, you want to get an accurate representation from all of the subgroups to represent the whole population. And then there's something called systematic sampling. And this is where, you know, you're going to study or survey every nth one. So for instance, again, you're in the dorm rooms, you've got 10 floors, but maybe you're just going to knock on every third door, every third door, and ask the students in the room, you know, whatever your question is. How do you like the dorm on a scale of one to 10 or something? So every third room, because it wouldn't make sense to only say use the bottom floor, because it might skew the results or bias the results. Maybe the bottom floor is great because students don't have to walk up all the stairs and there's no elevator. Or maybe students hate the bottom, bottom floor because it's too busy, right? You got too many people walking around because the cafeteria is down there too. And you wanna be careful not to just get the rooms that are next to like the bathrooms because maybe students like that because they're close to the bathroom. Maybe students don't like that because it's too busy and there's high traffic or something, right? So the idea of choosing your method is to try to reduce bias, try to collect a great representation of the overall population. And you want to hopefully come up with a time and cost effective, efficient method. And the last method here in this table is called cluster sampling. This is similar to stratified sampling, but with cluster sampling, like using the same example up here with the students in the dorms, you know, you would still choose 10 floors. I'm oh, sorry, there are 10 floors. You would still choose three floors. But then you would survey all of the rooms on those, in those, uh, three floors. 
So that's the difference. All the students at those floors. Instead of just some random selection from those three floors. That's the main difference. You know, with like the Taco Bell example, there are hundreds of Taco Bells nationwide. You're gonna randomly choose 50 Taco Bells and then you're gonna survey every single employee in those 50 Taco Bells, okay? Are you guys good? Are you with me? Anybody want to give me a thumbs up, like a heart, anything? Sure, go ahead. Um, yes, my question for cluster sampling is if, like you said, 10 floors, you would choose three floors and interview all people on the three floors. But if it was the like the Taco Bell example, you would choose 50 and then interview all the employees at each location. Okay. So why, it's a little different, right? Because the cluster sampling, you choose three floors out of the 10, but then- Well, because there, there are only 10 floors. Okay, so- So with the Taco Bell example, maybe there are a thousand Taco Bells. So it's the oh, same I exact idea. I, I see it. Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah. So I didn't even need to include that information. Maybe that added confusion, you know. Oh. I was just saying some of those buildings are pretty tall, you know. <laughs> but just three random floors, and then you're going to choose a certain number of students on each floor versus, you know, again, who cares how many floors? You're going to choose three random floors and then, you know, interview all students. So that's really the big difference. You know, some portion of each one or all at each one. All right. So all is cluster. Yep. And the way I kind of remember it, sorry about that. I'm kind of craving Taco Bell now too. And I'm vegan and, you know, it's one of the few fast food places that have some vegan options for me. Um, but yeah, I think of it as, you know, you're literally going to like interview or, or sample like the entire cluster. So I'm thinking of like, there's a Taco Bell, there's a Taco Bell, there's a Taco Bell, you know. So you're going to pick a cluster of Taco Bells and interview everybody there. Okay, thank I don't know you so much. Helps. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I appreciate you asking because these two are often kind of confused, you know. All right. Oh gosh, am I writing in there? Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying. I'm making this really messy. God. So maybe to summarize, like, um, you know, you choose subgroups. And same with cluster, you choose subgroups. Like, you know, like, okay, like three floors. or like 50 Taco Bells, okay, same here. Like you choose three floors at random, 
you choose 50 Taco Bells at random. And then the difference is, you know, you take a random sample. from each from each floor or a random sample from each of the 50 taco levels but here you study every one at at each, Oops. every one at each. Okay, so that's the difference. In both, you're, you're making these subgroups. You're either then gonna take some random sample from each one, or you're gonna take the whole thing at each one. You know, one, one easy way to determine which one would be better is, you know, if there weren't very many people in a particular subgroup, like, okay, let's say, um, let's say instead of Taco Bells, you're talking about state farm offices, okay? State farm offices are nationwide. And, you know, you're kind of, kind of from headquarters and you wanna know how employees at State Farm feel about working at State Farm. Well, I don't know if you know, but State Farm, a State Farm office usually doesn't have very many people working there. You know, my cousin owns one, so I know. And maybe it's just her location, but I think she has like three people. So, you know, once you chose the actual State Farm office, you would want to study every single one there. Because if there are only four people, you wouldn't want to go further and randomly like select one or two right? There's only four to begin with, so you would want to choose them all. Does that make sense? Any feedback on that? <laughs> okay, I'm going to move along. It's so quiet sometimes. Do you guys, does anybody want to come on camera with me? Okay, and then next up is um, convenience sampling. Convenience sampling. So as the name implies, you know, this type of sampling is done in a convenient way. Like it's done because it's convenient. And sometimes you just don't have the money or the time or the option to do anything else. So for instance, the people on the street, kind of the interviews, we've all seen those on the news, you know? And so, you know, I mean, it's great sometimes to just get the people on the street. What do you think about, you know, whatever you ask a question, but it's not very scientific, right? It's not, um, it's not necessarily, uh, the best representative sample to perhaps answer a question. So for, so for example, you know, thanks for coming on camera, um, <laughs> Christopher. <laughs> um, I'm like desperate for companionship right now. <laughs> um, so I don't know, like we wanna know, how do people think about you know, uh, thanks, Lauren. Hi. <laughs> oh, bummer. Yeah. Another, other Christopher broke his headset. Um, you know, you want to ask people about, you know, are donuts a good breakfast selection? And you're standing outside of the donut shop. Gee, the people you're asking are probably going to be more likely to say yes, right? Than just a more general kind of random sample of people 
you know, do people in California think that or do people in the country or Long Beach or whatever? So, all right. Um, convenience also refers to um, voluntarily submitted, you know, like survey responses or responses or like reviews. You guys, when you go to Yelp and you're looking up reviews or Amazon reviews, right? It's not that every single person who ever ordered that product on Amazon was required to fill out a survey. It's only people who choose to voluntarily take their time and go online or on their app, whatever, to write their feedback. Same with Rate My Professor. Thanks, Connor. Oh, we got a party going on now. Um, <laughs> you know, rate my professor, rate my teacher, all of these kinds of things. Like they're more likely to get people who either hate you as a professor, hate the product, hate the service, or they love the professor like me. Go to rate my professor, you'll see. And, um, <laughs> or they love the product, they love the tacos, you know. So people tend to go out of their way to make comments. Thank you. <laughs> when they really feel strongly one way or the other. And so you kind of have to take that with a grain of salt that you're not getting the full, you know, picture, right? Um, so these are convenient samples, convenient samples. Um, and they have some other examples here. Like the mall intercept mall intercept interviews without qualifying the respondents. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, just kind of like, hey, we want to know what what do Tesla owners think about, you know, the um, the change in hours for charging. We're gonna go on the street and ask people, hey, do you own a Tesla? <laughs> And the person's going to say yes, but do you really know that they, you know, own a Tesla if they're self-reporting that, right? So, okay, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm going over the top to give some examples here. But so let's see some of the homework. All these windows and just... You guys can't tell, but I, I, when you present, you know, the presenter here has so many different things showing up all the time. It's just terrible. Okay. We did discrete versus continuous. Now choosing units of measurement and an appropriate method. Thanks. It's just so frustrating, you know, I and mean, I've got all the stuff. So much stuff. All right. And it's like every time I open one thing, I have to move everything again. You know, it's just so frustrating. It's because I'm on a laptop too, but I don't think I can ever go back to a desktop. <gasps> All right. A scientist wants to find the average mass of fish living in a large pond. So she will use the masses of 52 fish from the pond to find the average mass. Answer the questions. Which units could be used for the unit of measurement? Okay, so for this, we actually need to know how to measure mass. And, um, you know, oftentimes the mass is confused with weight, but mass is measured in grams, milligrams, right? So the grams or, you know, centigrams or whatever, micrograms, kilograms. Um, it is, I just want to point out, it is different than weight. Weight is a force. 
And you guys might remember hearing at some point F equals MA, that famous equation. Maybe you've even seen it in a movie or something. And that says that force is equal to mass times acceleration. So like your weight in pounds equals your mass times the acceleration due to gravity on planet Earth. So your weight on a different planet would be different. It's actually a force. Weight is a force. So same with every single object that is made up of mass. On planet Earth, gravity is pulling it down. And so there's a force and that's what's causing it to go downward. Anywho. Um, so meters, centimeters, and millimeters are all measurements of length, right? They're all measurements of length, not mass. All right, which of the procedures below would be the best way to find the average mass? So the scientist wants to find the average mass of all the fish living in the pond. So that's the population, all the fish in the pond. She wants to find the average mass. That's the population parameter she's trying to find. Trying to remind you of some of the terminology. She has 52 fish, that's her sample. And she's gonna calculate the, ma the average mass of those 52. That's her sample statistic. So what's the best way? Randomly pick 52 from the entire pond and weigh each of them. Randomly pick 52 and estimate their mass. Pick from the shallow region and do one or the other. And yeah, absolutely, Christopher. The first one is the best one. I forget, I can actually click. You know, first of all, we do not want to just choose those living in the shallow region, right? We want to get the average mass of all the fish in this pond. If we restrict ourselves to the shallow region, you might just have tiny fish living there, right? So this is the kinds of thought processes that we need to go through when we're conducting a study. So that knocks out the first two there. And of course, we don't need to estimate when we can actually weigh them. <laughs> so that's gonna be a better way, right? So there we go. Let's see. Go ahead and think through this one and then I'll put the answers up. And good question, in what instance would you estimate? You know, I would say if it's not feasible, right? If it's not feasible to literally measure something, like, um, you know, what's the mass of that piece of lava over there? <laughs> In that erupting volcano, hey, I really don't want to go check it out myself. Um, yeah, how can you weigh the fish easily? So I'm no scientist like that. But I mean, I guess I could picture, you know, with some kind of a little portable scale and you've got a fish net. And see, I just wouldn't want to hurt the fish, right? I would hope that they would not kill the fish and then bring them to a room to weigh them. I'd have the portable scale, scoop the fish, put it on the scale and put them back. That's what I would be doing. Um, so yeah, sometimes it just, it might not be feasible to get an actual you know, weight or whatever characteristic. Okay, no worries. You guys are all free to come and go. I appreciate you know, you sharing, but I know sometimes stuff happens and you do have to maybe come and go. So that's totally fine. All right, so let me press solve here. All right, Josh wants to find the average height of students in the 12th grade 
at Washington High School. So the population is all of the 12th grade students at that high school. The parameter Josh is trying to find is the average height of those students. So he's gonna use a sample of students in the 12th grade to find the average height. So that'll be his statistic that he's calculating. So for height, now we do want these measures of length, right? You could measure length or height in meters, centimeters, millimeters. Um, and so, yeah, you wouldn't want to take three volunteers, right? <laughs> I mean, first of all, it's not very many students, but also the ones volunteering, I mean, do they represent a good sample to represent that population? You know, were they just, um, you know, walking off the basketball court <laughs> and they're coming over to volunteer? I don't know. You don't want to ask volunteers either to state their own heights. You know, maybe, maybe students who think they're tall or too tall don't want to share. Maybe students who think they're short or too short don't want to share, right? So there are all these types of things. Um, so yeah, you'd want to randomly pick 20 and then measure their heights, okay? Yep, Nancy, you got it. All right, which of the following surveys would best represent the entire population of households? Okay, so town officials want to estimate the number of households that own a dog. And what would be the best way to survey? Are you gonna only survey within a mile of a park? <laughs> That's probably not the best plan, right? Because if you own a dog, you might be more likely to go to the park. And maybe if you have a garage, you're more likely to have like a big SUV for your big dog or something. I don't know. Um, and then, yeah. So C, like you said there, randomly select 50 households from the town. And then you find out 14 out of the 50 have a dog. So using that answer, estimate how many households out of 850 have a dog. So 14 out of 50. That means 14 divided by 50 kind of do this one by hand to get a percentage. You wanna get a hundred on the bottom. So you would multiply by two on the bottom. If you multiply by two on the bottom, you have to multiply by two on the top because that's a fraction that equals one and you're not changing the value. So that is 28 out of a hundred. So 28% of the households own a dog. You can write 28%, right? That's 28 hundredths in decimal form. That's 28 hundredths. And now take the 28% of 850. The word of literally means to multiply. So that is 0 0.028 times 850. And they even give you a calculator here. Point 0.28 times 850. 
All right. So you could have done the 14 over 50 on your calculator too. 14 divided by 50 is 0.28. I'm just saying. But honestly, that I do in my head, right? Because it's so easy to multiply by two, and it's 28%. Guys, try this one. Anybody get an answer for how many students? How many students drive to school? Is one answer. Connor got that right instead of Christopher. Okay, so first we have to get part A right, right? So we want to know the number of students in the entire school who drive to school. So we don't wanna select people just from the club, chess club or just from the 11th grade, right? We need to randomly select them from the whole school when we're trying to estimate and learn something about all the students in the whole school. So that is six out of 25. So now here to get 100, you're gonna multiply by four on the bottom because percent literally means per 100. So that's 24 hundredths or 24%. Okay, guys, again, you could also just do six divided by 25. and you get 24 hundredths. And so that's what portion of the 1,550 students ought to drive to school. So it's 1,550 times 0.24, and you get 372. So does that make sense? So I took that percentage of 1,550. Okay.
You guys can try this one. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, we did that. All right, classifying samples. So now, you know, they're asking you to classify these types of sampling methods here. So the first one, counselors at a college want to poll students about how much time the students spend studying. Which of the following best describes a random sample of students? The, the students living in a particular dorm building on campus are easily accessible, so the counselor selects 78 students from that one dorm. So obviously not a good choice, right? I mean, how much time students been studying, maybe that's the party dorm. <laughs> I lived in one of those ones. And, you know, I was constantly like, can you please turn down the music or at least play something I like so I can study to it? Because, <laughs> all right. So the counselor forms groups of 13 students. Then they select all the students in six randomly chosen groups. That would be a cluster sampling, right? Break down into groups, choose a few of them, 
and then study everybody in those groups. So yeah, the third one, use a computer program, draw 78 students at random, select those students. Every set of 78 students is equally likely to be drawn by the computer program. So this is all good, right? Do you guys feel like you're learning this instead of just memorizing definitions and stuff, right? I just like to periodically touch base on that. We want to really focus on understanding and then nothing ought to be hard. <laughs> That's always my goal. Always my goal. All right. Organizers of a conference want to survey attendees about the registration fee. Which of the following best describes a stratified sample? So remember a stratified oops, sample. Right, this is where you break down into groups. And then within, within each group, you're going to so randomly select some. Not everybody in the group, like in the cluster, right? So see, cluster reminds me of everybody sticking together. It's all in each group. So this is just some in each group. Um, organizers form four groups, then select 16 attendees at random from each group. Okay. So here they, you know, they form groups, but then they select all in the group. That's cluster sampling. And that's a simple random sample. So it's that first one. All right, and part C is for convenience. Um, the microscopes in the first shipment are easily accept accessible. So he's just gonna test all of those. Not a good choice, right? But that's convenience sampling. Okay. Are these good? Okay. All right. And variation is going to be present in any set of data. Um, sampling variability is how much an estimate varies between samples. Okay, so I'm gonna, you know, randomly select 20 students and take the average hours they sleep. And then I'll take another random sample of 20 students and take the average hours they sleep. It's gonna dif differ from the first one. There's, you know, the odds of it being the exact same are pretty low. You know, you might get that, but each time you do a sample, it's probably gonna vary. So that's called the variation or sampling variability, okay? All right. 1.3 is on frequency, frequency tables and levels of measurement. Okay, so first let's talk about this level of measurement. And, you know, the way a set of data is measured is called its level of measurement. And there's kind of an order to this. So it starts at a nominal level and it increases all the way up to a ratio level. And I actually got this picture from Alex, and I kind of like how they organize this. Right? They say that the four levels of measurement are nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. And look, the first two, why does, 
Okay. The first two, nominal and ordinal, the first two are, you know, levels for categorical variables. Okay. The qualitative variables. So notice the nominal level is the lowest level of measurement. So a variable measured at the nominal level means it's categorical and there's no, you know, order or ranking to the categories. They're just categories. You know, what state are you from? What state were you born in? Which building is your class in? You know, one is not better or ranked higher than another one. It's just categorical. Um, you know, what color, what's your favorite color? I mean, they're, they're just categories with no ordering. The next level is categorical ordinal level. So this now does have some kind of a ranking to it. So it's like it gives us, you know, the, the individual category gives us some kind of more information. So it's like a higher level of measurement. So for instance, you're asking people, you know, how they liked something and maybe they're, they're answering in the categories, poor, fair, good, great, you know. So those categories have a natural order. Um, maybe, you know, what year of college are you? Freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. And there's a ranking, right? Freshman is first year, second year, third year, fourth year, fourth year, et cetera. And then the next two levels are for quantitative or numerical variables. The interval level, you know, it's numerical. And, you know, the difference between the values gives you some sort of, you know, ranking or order between the different categories, the, you know, numerical options. I shouldn't say category because of categorical, but I don't mean that kind of category. <laughs> the option, right? The numerical option. The big thing here is that there's no meaningful zero value in the sense that zero means there's none of it. So like, suppose you're measuring temperature. You know, if it's zero degrees Fahrenheit, you know, it's interesting because zero is less than like 50. But zero degrees doesn't mean you have no degrees. It doesn't mean you have no temperature. You know what I'm saying? It's on a scale, but that's a scale that we've created. Zero doesn't mean the absence of everything in that category. That's an interval level. Okay. Um. Yeah, like another... Good example is like the year of birth. You know, so between 2000 and 2010, there's 10 years that have gone by. But, you know, year zero does not mean the beginning of all time. <laughs> it's not like some initial time. And then the highest level of me measurement is called the ratio level. So this is a numerical you know, response. And the zero is literally the absence of the quantity being measured. Okay. So the weight at birth has a meaningful zero value, like zero pounds means the absence of any weight. You know, zero pounds, zero inches, um, you know, you're counting a number of books or something. Zero means you have zero books, right? So these are all ratio level variables. So we can actually rank these. 
So here are some homework questions that ask you about ranking as well. All right. So the amount of fluid ounces of coffee in a cup dispensed by a vending machine. So clearly that's quantitative, right? That's numerical. You have the number of ounces. It's not gonna be exactly like eight ounces. It might be 8.01. So that's a ratio level of measurement. Price of a shirt in dollars. So money, we use numbers. You know, we're gonna stick with dollars and cents though. So, and zero dollars means there is no money, right? So that's gonna be ratio. Occupation. Right, they're gonna be different categories. Are you in finance? Are you in art? Are you in business? This is categorical. And those are, you know, there's not um, some order to those categories. Why not? So nominal and ordinal are only for categorical variables. The first two are only for categorical, interval and ratio are only for quantitative. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth it to really get the quantitative and categorical down first. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then add the next layer. Yes, if numbers are involved, it'll either be interval or ratio. Yeah. And the only difference between those is if zero means none of the quantity being measured. Okay, you guys wanna try another one? So try this one. Now put these up. Right, so types of shirts, those are different categories. There's no order to them. It's just nominal or naming the categories. Closing price of the stock in dollars. So zero dollars actually means there's no money, no dollars. So that's ratio and it's money. The numbers. <laughs> a metal, gold, silver, bronze, those are categories, and those are ordinal, right? Gold is better than silver, is better than bronze, is better than none. Okay. All right, interpreting a tally table. So you guys have probably seen these tallies before. Like if you're counting something, one, two, three, four, and when you get to five, you cross. So it makes it kind of easier to look at all those marks. They're called tally marks. And like here, you can see five, 10, 14, right? That's three, that's five, 10, 11. That's five and three is eight. Five and one is six, right? So how many students chose green? That's eight. All right, frequency 
um, tables are commonly used. And so I'm just gonna pull up the answers here to help me with the counting. I'm starting to get stressed because time's running out. Um, so Tom's Electronics has five different models of cell phone. Yesterday, they sold 21 phones. These are the 21, that's seven, 14, 21 phones. And this is a frequency chart or table. Like for A, there's one, two, three, four. They sold four A phones yesterday. Three Bs, five Cs, et cetera, okay? And then there are four major phone plans available, but not every plan is available for every model. So the Horizon plan is only good for Model D. The Clear One plan is good on Model C and E, et cetera. How many cell phones can use Clear One? So it's the C's and the E's, so eight total. Okay. I think these are pretty straightforward, even if you hadn't taken a class. <laughs> I think, I could be wrong. Yep, yeah, and thanks for playing along here, Laura. Now for grouped data, this means you're gonna have, you know, some, um, like range of values. So here are shopping times and minutes of 10 shoppers, and then complete the grouped frequency distribution for the data. So these are the shopping times of the 10 people. And then we wanna know how many people shopped between 18 to 22 minutes? How many people shopped between 23 and 27 minutes? Right, so between 18 and 22, notice these are widths of five, we call them class widths. And you might think, wait a minute, 22 minus 18 is four. Why are they saying there's five? And it's because you have to add the one that you started at. This is the same with like page numbering. If you ever tried to figure out how many pages you've read, you know, if you started at page 18 and ended at page 22, you've actually read five pages. One, two, three, four, five. You always have to add the one you started at. Okay, and then you just count, you know, how many are between 18 and 22. Did I get them all? And then how many are between 23 and 27 is one. How many between 20, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So this is with grouped data because you're grouping in these class widths. It's like a classification. Uh, we just did that. All right, this last one is a two-way um, frequency table. And this question is just asking you to fill it out, fill out, you know, construct a two-way table. So each of 51 moviegoers was asked, what's your favorite movie type? And then there are men and women and there are comedy and action. So look, you can do, you know, men and women, comedy and action. Or you could put the comedy and action over here and put the men and women as columns. Either way, it's going to be the same. You know, the number of men who like comedy will go here. 
you know, you're still going to get the intersections of the rows and columns are those individual cells. So look, 10 men chose comedy. 12 women chose comedy. 15 men chose action. 14 women chose action. So that's it. You're just going to fill these out. And again, it doesn't matter. Because really, I could turn this chart like kind of sideways or whatever, and it's still going to be good. Okay. So that's it. If you guys want to try one of these, you can literally just sketch a little table. You know, I always start like that. And I'm going to have two things here and two things here. You know, maybe boys and girls, English and math, or the other way. So you can really see. And you don't have to put boys first and girls second either, you know. But as long as, you know, they are in the right intersection of row and column, you're gonna be good. Okay. All right. So like that's all the homework problems. And then the last thing I, that's correct, Lauren. There's really no math for these. It's really just construct the table. So just fill in, you know, make a table and fill it in. Yeah. Later on, we're going to be answering questions using tables, but not yet. And then I just wanted to um, share in 1.4, you know, I just want you guys to read this section. There is some additional terminology, but if we're gonna use it, you know, I'll call attention to it. But really, I just wanna point out that there is a whole field of ethics in research and in study design. Even when I did my dissertation where, you know, I studied a class and the students had to, you know, be informed and agree to be part of the study, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, that there's a whole world out there of ethics. Uh, back in the day, if you look back historically, there was no such thing. And, you know, there are kind of classic events where people were studied um, who weren't told and, you know, like bad things happened. Um, or were given pills or whatever without being told. So, I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff in our history. And then there's like a placebo effect, you know. And again, back in the day, uh, people were given like a sugar pill, but they were told this was a medication to like ease their anxiety. And then before you know it, their anxiety was gone even though they weren't really taking a true medication, it was just a sugar pill, but there was a placebo effect. They believed that they were gonna be like cured. And I'm totally oversimplifying, 
But um, I just want to point out, you know, some of these things. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm going to stop here. We only have a couple of minutes. And I feel like I've kept you late before. So we're going early. Two whole minutes. <laughs> uh, see you all next time. I'll see you. Um, today. Wednesday. Yeah, so I'll see you all uh, Monday. Have a great weekend. Let me know if I can be of any help.